In the spring of 1989, newspapers all over the world reported on one of the most unusual deals in history. The Soviet Union was to give the American PepsiCo company a fleet of 17 submarines, a cruiser, a destroyer, and a frigate. Despite the growing tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, Pepsi executive Don Kendall had made it his life's mission to penetrate the Soviet market, and by 1980, Russians were drinking a billion servings of locally bottled Pepsi a year. Still, Soviet law dictated that Russian money was useless outside of the nation's borders, so both sides had to get creative to get a good deal out of the exchange. Eventually, Stolichnaya Vodka was introduced in the United States, becoming a hit. But that didn't last long, and Russia then resorted to many of its old warships. It wouldn't take long before PepsiCo became the owner of the sixth largest navy in the world. A ruse. As tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union continued to grow during the Cold War, Don Kendall, a Pepsi executive, set his sights on selling his product beyond the Iron Curtain and establishing a line of trade with the communist superpower. The entrepreneur's most important goal for the company was international expansion. Since Coca-Cola dominated European soda sales, Kendall sought other untouched markets to get a foothold. His efforts duplicated Pepsi's international footprint in only six years, expanding its reach from 60 countries to nearly 120. Still, Kendall was desperate to do what Coca-Cola hadn't dared to, sell his soda in the Soviet Union. Although the superpower represented a significant source of untapped business, their secret, heavily guarded economic policies and the turbulent relationship with the U.S. turned the nation into a near-impossible business partner. In July of 1959, the Soviet Union held a six-week exhibit called the American National Exhibition in Sokolniki Park, Moscow. The event featured some of the most iconic American products, from cars to fashion to a real-size model house. Similarly, some of the most prominent brands were present with individual boots, including Disney, IBM, and Pepsi. On the night of July 23rd, Don Kendall approached then-Vice President Richard Nixon at the American Embassy in Moscow. As the head of the International Division, he told the politician his plans to put a Pepsi in Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev's hand. His objective was to get the politician hooked on the tasty product and convince him to sell it in his country. Nixon agreed, and the two men set up a ruse to get the Soviet leader to test the product. The following day, as the two men walked around the booths, they barbed about communism and the political liberation of captive states under Russian power. When Nixon and Khrushchev got to the PepsiCo stand, they noticed that the booth offered two batches, one with American water and the other with Soviet. After trying both, Khrushchev gleefully declared that the soda made with Russian water was clearly superior and refreshing. As he continued to drink the liquid, he insisted that his colleagues also try the soda. Soon photographers swarmed the booth and surrounded the small group as they fired off their bright flashbulbs, shooting Nixon and Khrushchev together as the Soviet leader sipped his cup of Pepsi, with Kendall standing to the side, pouring another cup. Kendall's plan had worked, and the Khrushchev photographs were published all over America and Soviet Russia. The planned photo op catapulted Don Kendall to the top ranks of the company, and in 1963, the 42-year-old officially became the corporation's CEO. Bartering Despite the Soviet Premier's immediate love for the sugary drink, and the positive press from the public relations stunt, diplomatic relations between the two nations cooled rapidly in 1960, leaving American companies cut off from the country behind the Iron Curtain and unable to do business with them. A lot happened during the following decade, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin War, and the Vietnam War, but in 1971, Kendall finally got a second chance to pitch Soviet executives on his product. Now President Nixon, held an international business conference with the Soviet's new chief executive, Alexei Kosygin, in which the Soviets expressed willingness to begin receiving shipments of the beverage. However, there was one crucial problem. Soviet law dictated that Russian money was useless outside of the nation's borders. Thus, the American company and the Soviet superpower resorted to one of the most ancient methods of business transactions, bartering. By 1972, 
Both parties agreed that Pepsi would receive Stolichnaya Vodka, the state-owned spirit, to distribute in the United States in return for the delicious cola. The monopoly deal locked all other American companies, most notably Coca-Cola, from selling their product, and cola syrup shipments began flowing through the Soviet Union, where it was bottled locally. By the end of the decade, Russians were drinking a billion servings of Pepsi a year, while on the other side of the world, Americans also enjoyed their side of the barter, as Stolichnaya, or Stoli, became highly popular. The bartering deal between Russia and Pepsi stood without issues for a few years, but in 1980, geopolitics got in the way. After the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the American public responded by boycotting Soviet-made products, including Stolichnaya vodka. The product sales then dropped enough for Pepsi to no longer consider the deal worthwhile, making it necessary to introduce a new bargaining point. The sixth largest navy in the world. In the spring of 1989, with Stolichnaya boycotted by the American folk, Pepsi made a one-of-a-kind deal with the Soviet Union. In the new agreement, the Soviets would transfer PepsiCo a large fleet of 17 submarines, a cruiser, a destroyer, and a frigate, immediately turning the privately owned company into the world's sixth largest navy. The United States government wasn't at all content to see a private corporation suddenly possess more naval firepower than many nations, but Don Kendall swiftly responded to the complaints. With all the aplomb one might expect from the top admiral of PepsiCo's navy, Kendall reminded the Pentagon that his company had managed to reduce the size of the Soviet fleet by a considerable number. He once told Brent Scowcroft, President George H.W. Bush's national security advisor, that PepsiCo was, quote, dismantling the Soviet Union faster than you are. Despite the bragging, the newly established PepsiCo Navy fleet was hardly seaworthy. The 17 submarines were in a state of disrepair, with many listing to one side and all showing rusting and decay. The surface ships weren't in better shape, and only one was genuinely seaworthy, while the others required constant pumping by a crew to keep them afloat. Owning the world's sixth largest navy was undoubtedly not on Don Kendall's plans for Pepsi, and shortly after taking possession of the fleet, the soda brand sold the submarines to a scrap recycling company for at least $150,000 each. Then, in 1990, PepsiCo and the Soviet Union signed the largest deal ever brokered between an American privately owned company and Russia. With this $300 million contract, the USSR promised to make Pepsi available to their citizens until 2000, in exchange for the rights to open Pizza Hut fast food restaurants in the Soviet Union. In return for this once-in-a-lifetime deal, PepsiCo was set to double its production in the Soviet Union and upgrade its Russian bottling facilities. Meanwhile, Russia would build an oil tanker fleet for Pepsi, and the American company would then lease the tankers to Norwegian companies and get money out of it. Push to the wall. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991, Pepsi's unprecedented deal came down with it. Suddenly, PepsiCo's four-decade balancing act turned into a scramble to protect its assets in a newly redrawn country, with new borders, inflation, and privatization. Although the company was already planning to pivot from glass bottles to plastic in the Soviet Union, it could not do so, as the plastic company was in Belarus. To make matters worse, Lithuania, which made the cheese for Pizza Hut, now asked for American dollars in payment. And the newly independent Ukraine, where Pepsi's remaining fleet was stranded, made similar demands. The company had no choice but to sell the fleet for scrap to recover a large sum of their money. Kendall, who had retired by then, lamented how the Soviet Union had essentially gone out of business and that his beloved company was suffering from the fallout. However, after several months of negotiations, Pepsi was finally able to put the deal's puzzle pieces somewhat back together. The problem was that instead of having to deal with one massive state, the company had to broker with 15 different nations. To make matters worse, as the Iron Curtain fell, Coca-Cola aggressively entered the market, and Pepsi struggled to maintain its advantage over the competitor. The company tried several different marketing strategies. One of them involved a giant Pepsi replica flying up to the Mir space station in 1996. They also set up two iconic billboards over the bustling Pushkin Square in Moscow. Despite the efforts, Coke beat out Pepsi as Russia's most drank cola in only a few years. 
However, even though Pepsi lost out to Coke in the Soviet Union, Don Kendall's 40-year efforts to open up his company's product to Soviet commerce are still legendary. In 2004, Kendall received the Russian Order of Friendship Medal from President Vladimir Putin, cementing his status as one of the most influential business figures in Soviet-American relations and a pioneer in bringing American fizzy drinks into his country. To this day, Russia is still Pepsi's second biggest market, outside of the continental United States. Thank you for watching our video. If you liked it, please give us a like and leave a comment below. And don't forget to turn on notifications to be the first to know of our newest content.